Fridays at the Fountain. Do you need to unwind after a busy week? We all do. Try Fridays at the Fountain in Crystal City, a weekly pop-up beer and wine garden with great live music and an outdoor beautiful setting. More at crystalcity.org. All right, you guys know that we love Pacers Shoes. They have many locations throughout the D.C. area, but did you know they also have an awesome podcast, Pace the Nation? Download it today on iTunes and check them out. Mm. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Warren. Yeah. Hey phrase, what's the phrase that you hear every day? Hey phrase, what's the phrase that you hear every day? Hey phrase, what's the phrase that you hear? Donna. Tune in, yeah, you gotta tune in. Sarah Fraser on the mic, and she about to be in the co-host with the most Paul one looking fleet. He always Take does. You should be listening. <laughs> Not from the nation's cap, culture at his hey. Don't need a second guess, separated from the rest. Hey. Entertaining nonetheless, many topics to address. <laughs> Welcome back after a long holiday oh weekend. Oh my gosh, I have come a long way. Seriously, it was Labor Day weekend. You literally did come a long I way. Literally. All the way from, um, <laughs> from Delaware. Delaware. Okay, yeah, that's pretty long. <laughs> All right, absolutely. How are you doing, hon? How's I'm life? Great. I'm great. I've been spoiled by my mom for the last four days. Oh my God. And your mom is like, oh I mean, honest to God, she's seriously like the black Paula Dean. It's like she is. you go up there and it's just like perfectly laid house. <laughs> is she already decorated for Christmas? I feel like your mom's like already decorated. Uh, yeah, no, she hasn't decorated for Christmas, but the food that she makes, oh my God, the food is so good. Really? Is it vegan? It's not. <laughs> it's really not. You know, I was drinking only oh, juice bummer. last week. I was on all yes. juice. And then I went there and I was like, the first day I was like, okay, she's like, what do you want me to get you? I was like, give me some kale and some spinach. And she got home with all that stuff. And I was like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> I'll I'll eat what you're cooking. Oh my god! Yeah. Is your mom one of those moms too that makes you feel guilty if you don't eat her cooking? Oh, absolutely. Your mom seems like she gives you a little bit of the guilt trip. She's like, well, you could have that juice, or I I fried some fish here. I'm like, I'll take the fried fish for two hundred, <laughs> Brenda. You know. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I want that. Oh, my God. Well, welcome back. You know, Thank and you. I've, I've been stalking your Instagram, as I usually do. And you know, I haven't posted much, right? I felt like you had. You, you, well, you posted two interesting things that I want to know about. Okay. Well, first of all, you're going, when are you going to Italy for your 40th birthday? Which I'm is like going, my 40th birthday is October 16th, and I'm leaving on the 18th. October 18th. Yeah. No. October 18th, yes. you're going. Okay. Mm-hmm. With Wanda Durant, Kevin Durant's yes. mom. I saw that on Facebook. Oh, I was yes. like, holy crap, you guys are going to, is Kevin going with you? And no, he's not going because Wanda's my friend. Oh, my God. Isn't That's that cool? amazing. I have yes. such cool friends. Um, yes, I have friends from do. London going. Um, I have uh, I have about 10 friends actually meeting in Milan for my birthday. That I think that's going to be so cool. It's unbelievable. No, wait. Is the guy that you've sort of been seeing that you're in like yes. with, is he going? The Brussels he man? He is going. Yes, he's coming over from Brussels to his place in Rome. So I'm going to fly uh, on the 18th to Rome. I'll meet him in Rome, and then we'll go to Milan together. Have you already dropped hints about what you want for your 40th? Are you getting a Rolex? I feel like you're getting a Rolex. <laughs> I haven't, you know what? I can't ask him for too much. I've done that before. I told you about the story. I told you I have learned from my past. So now you don't ask any uh, for much. But and then- I told you the story about the guy in the Porsche. Did I tell you about this? Mm, I feel like you did, but wait, keep going. What was it about? Okay, I dated a guy in New York. I might as well just tell his name. His name was Jonathan Moore, (laughs) okay? He was a restaurateur, and he owned a a hotel in Miami, I think called the Townhouse. Okay. And then in New York, he had Bond Street Restaurant. He had um, uh, Republic right on Union... Uh, Union oh, yeah, Union Square. Square there, sure. And he had something called APT, the apartment in the meatpacking district. Yes. So, okay. yeah, I dated this guy. We really liked each other and all of this. And one day we were walking. It was like in 2003. We were walking downtown Manhattan past the Porsche dealership. And he says, oh, let's walk in there. So we walk in. And the, the new Cayenne, that's when the SUV first oh, came yeah, out. yeah, right. So this guy says, I had been dating him for about six months. And he says, I want to buy you this car. <gasps> The what? Oh, my God. I would have died right there. Right. So, okay. Lesson. <laughs> here, here comes the lesson. So, I say, oh, it's lovely, but uh, he's like, well, what's the uh about? And I'm like, well, Range Rover just came out with their oh, new model. Oh, my God. I love 
I mean, you? they just came out. It's exactly the same price. You know, they're both around eighty thousand dollars. And I said, why don't we go over to Range Rover, and go on. You know, run one of those. And he says, well, I don't like the Range Rover. And I'm like, but you just said that you're going to buy it for me. So anyway, okay, so it started to fall apart in this moment. So I didn't take his hint. You oh know, he's God. like, oh, well, I kind of wanted to get you this. And I'm like, but I kind of want that. Yeah. Mm. So I call up Rosie Perez, who's a good friend of oh, mine sure. at that time. We were closer back in the day. But um, anyway, so she had bought a Range Rover from there. So she puts me in touch with these people over at Land Rover. Uh, of Manhattan, and I go over, meet the guy. They treat us like queens or kings, whatever. <laughs> queens, <laughs> I go kings, in, whatever. I pick out this Range Rover with all the options I want on it. I changed the steering wheel to like a wood steering wheel. I like did all this stuff on it, and they didn't ask for any deposit. They were just like, "Well, when do you want it?" And so I'm looking at him, and he is like turning all shades of pink, purple, <laughs> green, yellow, you know. And, and, you know, I could tell his energy he didn't want, but I was like, let me roll the dice because I'm trying to <laughs> roll out of here in my new Range Rover. And the crazy thing is I had a Range Rover at the time. Like, you know, so I, you didn't really need the no, other one. No, I had one, an but... older one. This is the new model. I was like, I need the new model. So anyway, um, they told me I could come get the Range Rover on, like, you know, maybe that was like a Monday, the following Wednesday or something. He was really quiet with me over the next week. <laughs> We're supposed to meet there at the Land Rover dealership at like 12 noon, let's just say on Wednesday. Did he send you up? I show up. The car, the guy takes me up to the roof. The car is there. It's silver. It's got a big bow on it. Okay. Oh Those people God. have put the wood steering wheel on this car and everything. They took the steering wheel off the stock car and put the wood steering wheel on it. And they didn't ask me for a deposit because Rosie Perez called for me. Wait, to do a fit. Yeah. And, and she's they're like, friend. oh, well, you know, hey, he must be special. Girl, 12 o'clock came. The man asked me if I want some lunch. No, you need some water. Yeah, I need a little water. My throat's a little dry. 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. I can't get a hold of him. I have made plans for the afternoon that did not involve this man. Oh, my God. I love this story. <laughs> I was going to go and pick up all my friends. I had to go to the bitch was busy. Okay. I had to go to Brooklyn. I had to go to Harlem. I needed to pick some people up. Okay. Three o'clock, three thirty. He finally calls me back, and he's like, "You know, I was just thinking that um, maybe instead of this car, we should move in together and get a bigger apartment." <gasps> oh and my I'm god! Like, oh my god! Uh, uh, and the guy is like looking at me like, "What's he saying? What's he saying?" And I'm just like <laughs> holding one finger up, like barely standing. You know, I mean, that is the equivalent. Like, I, I how do you get? Out of there, though. Do you just like go? Hey, I'm going to go downstairs to the bathroom. I'll be right One back. One of these. I just. I, I, just uh, I, just call, I have to call you. I mean, I just was so done. Okay, so I got off the phone with the guy. We met oh later God, that night, so and I went off. Did you ever see that version that a Sex in the City when Charlotte went off on Harry? And she's like, what do you think people say when they see us walking down the street together? Yes, yes. Okay, so I have one of those moments. <laughs> I'm like, because oh he was a lot God. shorter than me. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I'm like, what do you think people say when I'm walking down the street with you? <laughs> Shit, I deserve a range roll-up. <laughs> so anyway, to make a long story short. Was that the end? I got over it. I tried to apologize to him, and he was like, the things you said, I can never recover from, <laughs> and, and we're done. Wow. So, no apartment, no Range Rover, no Porsche. <laughs> so I should have just shut the fuck up. So, I am not asking this man or any other man for a Rolex. Oh, my God. You are a riot. That's it. That is great. Well, that is a way to go into your 40th. That is amazing. I've learned lessons in this lifetime, Sarah. Oh, my God. You totally have. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was just the best kickoff to this post-Labor Day podcast. Right? Um, I was in, before we get into, we have tons of listener emails to get to. And then there's so many interesting stories that have happened, too. The nurse we got to talk about in. Utah, who was like body slammed and okay. arrested. Um, and then I want to ask you a really good question, too. I, I thought this story was great, but after I don't even know how many years, 12, 13 years, um, over the weekend, Brad Pitt called Jennifer Aniston to Ooh. apologize to her okay. about everything that went down. And I just thought to myself, I have many questions for you. I thought, yeah. who in Paul's past would he want to hear from? And would you even want an apology from, from somebody that you dated that wow. did you wrong? So wait, don't answer now because we'll get to that. Okay. Um, I was just going to tell you, 
Uh, Paul was in Delaware for visiting his family for yeah. the long weekend. I was in um, Detroit, and yeah. I'm very happy to be back because Dan, my boyfriend, became an uncle, and I feel like the pressure is completely off. I have no pressure to have a baby. I am was that a boy? Really good. It's a little boy. Yes. Okay, so they can, he can carry on the family name. He can carry on the family Raven name. <laughs> Yes, I got one more year, no baby. <laughs> Although I, ha- I have to say I am joking because I, ha- I have been having a little bit of baby fever. Yeah. So yeah. what was Detroit like? It was great. We had a really good time. We went to a couple big um, fe- festivals. Well, one, we went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where University of Michigan was. And that was actually kind of quiet because um, there wasn't a U of M football game that mm-hmm. weekend. So we went to Zingerman's, um, which is this very famous deli-, deli, and we had a Reuben there, um, which was great. It was just an incredibly long line and uh, probably not really. It was like a little overrated. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Hill Harper, you know, Hill Harper, the yes. actor. So. He's a buddy. And he just actually bought a, a building there, and he's actually making, like, a, an, a coffee house, like, right downtown. He's in, in an area that's being gentrified. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's super up and coming and hipster. And yeah? Yeah, it's totally changing. Did you go down there? We didn't this trip. We went to Royal Oak, which is kind of like a suburb... I'm trying to think of how... The, the, here's the craziest thing that I always have a hard time when I go to Detroit wrapping my head around. It's just so massive. And you have just sprawling street after street after street. And it's all considered Detroit. Okay. But it's not really... I keep thinking of it as like Washington, D.C. Like, D.C. is fairly small. And then you have all the suburbs. But it's like imagining that you're... If you're in Leesburg, Virginia, you're still in Detroit. Wow. Like, isn't that weird? Okay. It's very hard it. for me to wrap my head okay. around. So we went to this Arts, Beats, and Eats, which was really cool. It was this outdoor like music festival and food festival, and we stuffed our faces. But I, awesome. I was sick for like two days. I can't do it anymore. Like I, I, Paul, it's just becoming a nightmare. I don't know if you have this issue because you're very healthy. Okay. But I realized, like, my body now is, like, no fun anymore. Okay. You know, I used to be the girl. I was, like, 50 pounds heavier. <laughs> I was always, like, six drinks in, and then I would just eat cheeseburgers. And honestly, like, I was always, like, in a food mm-hmm, eating mm-hmm, contest. Mm-hmm. But I feel like I abuse my body so much. Now, I can't have anything. I wow. eat fried food and ice cream. I have stomach ache for days. Stomach ache? Do you have to go Dry right to bed? Dry heaving. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's You get worst. itis? You know what itis is? No, what's that? Oh, well, <laughs> we said in the pre-show meeting we weren't going to talk about race so much, but <laughs> what is itis? itis? They 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 say you know they they say that you know black people when they eat like you know soul food dinners and stuff and all the food like you know you eat and then you get tired you get itis. You so get... I mean maybe that's for everybody, but I don't know. I have all black relatives, so well mostly actually I don't. Yeah, you got a white stepbrother. I yeah. didn't even know you had a white stepbrother. You didn't. No. Well, so I guess we can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, my trip was great. It was really cute. The baby was adorable. and uh, But, uh, yeah, I can't even eat anymore, like, for fun. Oh, my God. I know. It's depressing. I'm just going to have to be completely vegan. <gasps> I'm going to... You know what's my, becoming my worst nightmare is I'm going to be that woman that has to bring her food everywhere she everywhere. goes. You know how embarrassing that is? Like, yeah. You're like, no, I'm not going to be eating. I, I brought my own uh, Vegemite sandwich. Like, yeah. I'm becoming that woman. Well, I got to tell you, last week when I did all juicing, I had so much energy and I slept I like a baby. Really? Yeah, I don't feel as clear right now. I really don't. I know, because see, yeah. once you get on the health track, mm-hmm. it's like you can't go back. You start down this vegan path, you're eating salads, you're juicing, you're like, mm-hmm. I have a, so much energy, I feel mm-hmm. like a million bucks. And then you go have like fried dough, and it's just like, no. And you get itis. Yeah, you get serious itis. And yeah, you itis. Go right to bed. Yeah, and I actually write about cramps. that in my book. It's really funny. <laughs> About how my family, like I, I went to the doctor. I, well, I told you that I thought I had narcolepsy at some point. Yes, yes. I was like, I think I'm narcoleptic, you know, because I'm a bit of a hypochondriac also. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> no, you know what I'm saying. I know what you so mean. So I, I thought that, and they were like, No, you just sleep a lot. <laughs> like you know, like we got to get to the root of that, and the root of that was the food. Isn't it crazy? It was oh the my food. God. Anyway. So yeah, speaking of the white side of my family, so yes. check this out. Okay, so my mom, of course, is married to Chip, my stepfather. And Chip is white. And Chip is white. Okay, for some reason I thought Chip was black. Chip is anyway. white. So when they got together, maybe I was about, uh, I don't know, maybe 12. Okay, wow, And so yes. his son was seven at the time, Chris. Um, so, you know, I'm the younger brother to my sister, Holly, and then Chris became my younger brother. So on Friday nights, we would have, like, pizza night, and I would make him, like, um, choreograph Janet Jackson videos with me. You know, <laughs> He would be on, like, the uh, rewind duty on the VCR with his <laughs> finger, like, because I lost the remote or broke it. So he'd have to 
like rewind it as I was learning the, the moves. Oh my God. Right. So he remembers all of this. So Chris, you know, I moved away when I was 19 to New York. Chris was then 14. I didn't, I just lost touch with him. Sure. Yeah. You're older. You're in a different place. I lost touch with him. And then he moved away to go to college and we have lost touch. I have not seen Chris in 20 years. Really? 20 years. Oh my God. And we made a point, um, it, you know, this weekend, this last weekend to meet at our parents' house in wow. Delaware. And he brought his new son, Cole. He's married to his beautiful, wonderful woman named Katie, who I loved. I absolutely adored her. And his new son, Cole, who, oh my God, that is the cutest little baby I've ever seen. Do you want to have one? I, it made me want to have one. <laughs> I was like, I'm. I, it's something to think about. It's something to th- I know, but then yeah. It's something to, yeah. Then yeah, all, yeah, yeah. Then the you think stuff. about yeah, exactly all the other stuff. But it was great to see him. The love came right back. It's so interesting to see someone. He's 35 now. I think the last time I saw him, he was like 14 or 15, 15 years old. Wow. Um, but you still see that part of that person. You know that it's the eyes are still there the heart's still there right and you know i posted about this but i said it's never too late to reconnect with someone if the love is really there oh i love that you know it's never really really too late you know you think oh too much time has passed but all you have to do is reach out as soon as that one ping i sent a text and then you text right back and we were right there and then we met up this weekend and i put him in a headlock (laughs) And I gave him a noogie. <laughs> I was like, mm-hmm, don't forget who's boss. I'm the big brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it like all came back. It all came back. Oh, it was awesome. just, it was a wonderful, wonderful weekend. But yes, they're white and I love them. <laughs> And I love them. Um, well, look, we have so many stories to get to, so let's talk about that. And then Paul and I also watched, if you haven't watched the di- the documentary, Whitney, Can I Be? <gasps> oh, my, my God. God. On Stars Network. Obsessed. Oh we both watched. Oh Paul God. and I did. And now we, like, love it. Um, so a couple of big stories that are in the, the news is the Utah hospital now is standing by the nurse. You probably have seen this because it was all mm-hmm. over Facebook for the past, like, three or four days. But the University of Utah hospital where a nurse was manhandled and arrested by police as she protected the legal rights of a patient has imposed new restrictions on law enforcement, including barring officers from patient care areas and from direct contact with nurses. Did you see that video, by the I way, I did. I saw it. What'd you think? I thought she... I, I want a nurse like her. Oh, my God. I, I Wasn't really she do. good? Yeah, she, she was, like was firecracker. Yes, yes. You can't just barge in and, and expect to get blood or urine or from someone that's unconscious and not giving consent. I'm playing a bit, little bit of the video here um, that's been circulating. University of Utah Hospital nurse Alex Wubbles says she was just trying to do her job. Yeah. And walk. But doing her job on July 26th ended with her arrest. What is going on? Crazy. I Puts her betrayed. in the car. Here she is giving I an feel, interview. Um, Angry? I feel a lot of things. If things still keep going the way they're going, I'm arresting her. Oh it all my God. started this after cop. she received mm. a patient from a car crash. The patient was comatose, and Detective Jeff Payne wanted a blood sample. But citing hospital policy on sharing blood samples for alcohol and drug tests, wow. Bubbles denied the request. I'm just trying to... Isn't that amazing, though? Mm. I mean, do you feel like the the, the officer had any rights there? That It was a serious crash. She laid it right out, though. I mean, it was textbook. Yeah, she She basically said, said, you got to have a warrant. you got to have... Yes. Under these circumstances, this is what I need. Bit, bam, boom. It needs to be one of these three things. Is any of these three things... No, he didn't have it. He said, okay, well, you're going downtown. I mean... You I know. know. So, yeah, I was horrified by that. But also, I thought it was interesting just watching, even though he was completely kind of off his rocker, but it's interesting to me watching the other police deal with a, the cop that goes off the rails. They're so gentle with they that. They don't even, they, they don't react. He kind I of mean, patted the guy on the back <laughs> a little bit, just a little bit. Like, nobody ever shakes the shit out of these guys. Like, hold up. I know, they never argue with each other. Yeah. And maybe that's because they know they're being recorded. A lot of this was taken from the officer's body cam um body cam video that he had on and detective Jeff Payne who persisted in demanding a blood sample from an unconscious truck driver at the hospital who had earlier been involved in an accident stemming from police pursuit of the suspect he's now on suspension and under investigation hmm. um, and by the way this nurse is about to get a massive payout Damn! don't you think I, <laughs> I just mean, wanted to know totally who him. could get me and um, <laughs> I mean who could drag me out of a place like that where I could get myself a little check I mean what, what do I have to be 
Uh, great. Uh, I'm not trying to make light of the situation, <laughs> but how can I get me a settlement? Shit. I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things, right? It's just in that moment you never expected to happen. But I thought the officer was way out of line. I don't know. I understand they're trying to do their job and get a blood sample, and I get the severity of it. But I, you got to have the proper procedure. You know what I hate that I'm thinking right now, and I'm what? just going to say because we vowed to be honest on this podcast. <laughs> if this woman was black, yeah, what would would he have been even more rough on her? Because I'm so used to seeing these police officers like get into some serious scuffles with you know black motorists and different people that some people that aren't necessarily doing anything. Like, she was completely outraged, but at the same time, I was like, wow, no bruises, no scrapes. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, she, she came out of it pretty clean, you know? I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I That's a good question. I, I don't mean, know what I would don't happen. know. I don't know. And maybe somebody will write in and, you know, say I've got issues. But Please, yeah. But please. You always, well, please. Uh, you can always write us, no matter what you want to write. But yeah, it's yeah, uh, Paul Wharton style at yahoo.com, yeah. and it's Sarah at heyfreesh.com. Yeah. Anyway, okay. um, yeah, she's going to get a huge payout. But uh, you know what? But she gets two thumbs up from me for standing up for what was right. She was really just following the books, but actually she was standing up for what, what was right. Yeah, she was, exactly. And she did a great job. And yeah. I'm with you. I think the most shocking thing, too, was the police officers that just basically stood there. And they, they all, you're right. And they were just like, okay. You know, they were like, Call me. it's like, hello. I mean, doesn't right. anybody, ever, you guys all know the law. But like, actually, that really would have served him better and his family better if somebody would have shaken the shit out of him and gotten him in check. Like, I'm a, yeah. I don't know about you. I'm going to give you shaking baby syndrome today because I'm trying to help you. Because you're out of line. You're out of line. It's going to cost you your career and it's going to impact your family. Oh, yeah. That guy's done. Totally done. <laughs> uh, do you believe, you know, because we podcast live out of the D.C. area. Do you believe it's now easier for men to marry up than it is for women? And, and this new study out, and by the way, thanks to our listener, Mike Scott, who sent this story. Um, nice. But Washingtonian Magazine wrote about this. And the reason that it's so hard for a D.C. woman to find a date, they're just too educated. But according to a new study published in, in uh, Demography, the fact that it's now more likely for women to have a college degree than it is for men may also be changing the marriage market, making it harder for women to, quote, marry up by marrying someone who is more educated. You think that's true? Hmm. I haven't really thought of it like that. Um, they say, but before we start patting ourselves on the back for women's empowerment education, not too fast. Well, it's great that more women are getting college degrees. The study also argues that marriage may now be more likely to financially benefit men than women now because men don't, aren't going to have as much college debt. So the women are taking in all this debt. They're getting mm -hmm. married to this guy. They might be making six figures, seven figures. This guy's like, hey, look, I didn't even go to college. I do heating and air conditioning. That's a great job. I'm not making fun of it. But then this chick is getting divorced five years later. She's got a college loan. She yeah. pays him. What do you think? This is like a huge ro role reversal. I guess it is. I guess as I've gotten older, you know, my definition of like marrying up has kind of gone away. I feel like if you, you know, if you get some cash, if the other person has like an influx of cash, like great for you. But I don't know. I'm really all about connecting on another level. But, I mean, I do have to hear what's going on out there and, and try to be a part of this conversation. But I don't know. I just feel like, so what? If she has more education or does better, I mean, don't people know what they're getting into? I think they do. I just think it's probably, I guess, if anything, you think... Yeah, it's a complete role reversal. Well, I have a is, friend. Which is kind of cool, but... I guess it sounds like it, it makes it harder sometimes for women. Yeah, I have a friend, and she just bought a house with her, with her new husband, and she's got a lot more money than him, but they split it down the middle, and she put all cash. Would you do that? She put a million dollars cash, and he basically took a mortgage out on his part. Really? Right. Wow. wow. Isn't that something? Yeah. I mean, honestly, well, when I met Dan, I was making a lot more money, not anymore. Now I'm like, hey. <laughs> Did you ever hold that over his head? No, I don't think so. But I think we always like paid for things on a scale. Did you I knew... consider yourself a sugar mama at the time? Just mm. maybe deep down inside? No, or I... you kind of like, I'm running this checkbook. <laughs> And all that. I do. I actually yeah. did like making more money. I yeah. do think that subconsciously there is a little bit of, um, you don't like throw it in anyone's face. I just like being independent. Mm -hmm. I like never having to ever rely on a, a man. Ever. Mm -hmm. I just, and I think women should always have their own checking accounts, even if you're married. I 
think sure. you always should keep some shit separate because Absolutely. you just don't know. You don't know. Yeah. But anyway, I thought it was that story was was pretty interesting. Um, Brad Pitt has apologized to Jennifer Aniston after 12 years. Everybody, of course, knows the famous story where uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie met on the set of Mr. and Mrs. Smith when they were filming, and then they claimed that they didn't have an affair until mm. after he told Jen Aniston okay. that they basically were in love. Mm-hmm. I don't know if anyone believes that, but he recently called her to apologize, and Jennifer Aniston took his call. What? You think that's weird? Like, would you ever want somebody from your past? Like, the guy, for example, in New York, right, that, okay. had, that had side pieces going on, wasn't, like, really gay. Would you ever want him to call you and apologize? That fool. Uh, I don't call. Listen, if you listen, do not call me. No. <laughs> no. But, you know, the interesting thing about this is you met one of my exes at the yes. uh, Hey Phrase uh, Happy Hour. Oh, my God. At our Happy Hour. That we had hour. over at Whitlow's. Yes, I did. I didn't even know you two dated until he Let came up to me. Let me tell you something. You would not have known that we dated because we dated back in 2011. And when we broke up, we broke up on a Thursday. I was in the Gay Pride Parade on Saturday. This man was mad at me. Okay, let me tell you. He brought a guy. Now, my mom was was in the parade with me. I was like one of the grand marshals. Oh, okay, my God, I love Of the it. Gay Pride Parade. I just broke up with this man on Thursday night, might I just add. Thursday oh. night. The parade was Saturday morning. <laughs> My mom and I are walking, trying to find my float. And here he comes walking directly up to us with another guy on his back, giving a guy a piggyback well, ride. Well, damn, that was quick. Okay. I, 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 I think I'm he like, does listen to our podcast. <laughs> does he? Yes, everybody does. <laughs> everybody does. People that I don't even think about that are listening go, oh, I listened to your podcast. And you're like, Ugh. So at that time, I didn't think that there was ever anything he could say. And he didn't think there's, there was ever anything I could say. That would make us want to talk to each other. Wow. Because he said at the time that, (laughs) because he's a very talented graphic designer. Mm -hmm. And shit, I need a lot of graphic design work. So (laughs) basically, (laughs) when he would come to my house in the evening, I would have him like helping me with my graphic design stuff. You know, I and I'd be it. cooking stuff. <laughs> you know, I would put the shows on that he liked. As long as he had his laptop set up, I definitely needed him to work on a couple of my things. So he just love felt, <laughs> right. Yes, why not? I, exactly. I think Dan helped me with my business plan. Do you know what I mean? Yes, that's what a partner you know? or your significant other should be doing. Absolutely. So we definitely fell out, but I thought it was awesome. We had a serious full circle moment that he was there at that happy hour. And now we're just, I really enjoy him. I enjoy his company. Oh I really God. do. See, I do admire that. I think mm-hmm. that the I think gay men especially are better about staying friends with their exes. Mm-hmm. Is that true or am I stereotyping? Well, I think it's I think in the beginning, like they can be real bitches when you break up. I mean, <laughs> talk about revenge as a dish that's served cold. <laughs> oh, we invented that shit. Oh really? So, oh God, we'll get you back. And then but then I feel like it all smooths over and you guys are all good. Yeah. After a while, you know, and alcohol is the great equalizer. There is, there's only one guy I can think of from my past who was an older guy that I dated who basically, like, we dated and I, like, he was kind of more of a rebound guy, but then he, he I felt like I was you for a minute. Like, he had this really nice pool in Northwest <laughs> D.C. He led, like, this great Range Rover. We were going out all the time. I think I was more in love with the money. But, uh... We went out for like three months and we were hanging out like all the time. And then he completely dro- just like ghosted me and completely wow. dropped me. Yeah, that was like a little devastating. Yes. Wow, the mm-hmm. ghosting. I know. Well, this guy was like 48 at okay. the time, which also, again, I, I was probably like 30. So I really shouldn't have been dating somebody 48. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, um, I mean, I'd like to hear from him and know where the fuck you've been. Like that would. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't care. Really. Let me tell you, I had this guy ghost me once. And because he found out. <laughs> Why? What could he have possibly found out about you? <laughs> I was living in New York. And this guy is a famous stylist. His name is Irve. I won't say his last name. But his name is Irve. And he lived in the West Village. And one day we're chilling. And uh, basically, I won't get into all the details, but Sarah Jessica Parker was his friend and neighbor. Oh, okay? God. So I meet Sarah Jessica Parker with Hervé. She loves Hervé. It's her friend and her neighbor. Okay, now I had just happened to have been breaking up with Hervé that day. <laughs> that was my plan. I didn't know he knew Carrie Bradshaw. Oh. <laughs> I did not. You know what I mean? That will change things. <laughs> that really, Do you know? know like, I can stay with Hervé for a while. Um, yes, actually, I can stay over tonight. <laughs> 
Do you know what I mean? I do. So somehow through a friend of his um, that knew a friend of mine, he put the pieces together that, look, this relationship was on the rocks, but hey, now <laughs> we, we know SJP, so we good. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Oh my God, I love him. And he ghosted me. And then later I found out, I mean, I was calling him. I remember that was the time oh. when, that was like the beginning of uh, the time. Something was wrong with my cell phone. I don't know what, I remember calling him from the payphone. Oh like my God, on, trying to get a hold of him. Oh, trying to get a hold of him. Oh, that is so I funny. think I called him from the payphone because he wasn't answering my call. And he wasn't having it. He was not having it. He ghosted me because he found out that I was in a, you know, I was in a relationship with him because of the Sex and the City connection. Oh, well, there you go. Well, we've all been there. <laughs> I know, and I'm not really owed any. I can't even think of anybody that owes me an apology. I feel like, you know what I mean? It's yeah. just not. Yeah. Um, we both watched the Stars documentary. I, I mean, I've been obsessed Ooh. with it ever since. I'm actually trying to reach out Wasn't to all the... Wasn't it Showtime? It was Stars? Was it Showtime? I think it was Showtime. No, maybe you're right. Maybe it was Showtime. Um, but the documentary, Whitney, Can I Be? And a Can guy, I Be Me? Can I Be Me? Mm. Oh, my God. It was so good. And I'm trying to reach out to Nick Broomfield, the director, to have him on because he's oh, yeah. done a ton of films all about Hollywood celebrities. Tupac and Biggie, Kurt Cobain, mm. um, Whitney Houston. So uh, what did you think? About it? And I, I'm obsessed with documentaries. So this is the latest one that I've been watching. What did you think? Well, it was... It was eye-opening, and it was really sad in a way because, you know, she came from the church. Right. Um, her mom and Bobby, everybody that claimed to love her was around her. And you could see that this woman was barely breathing. So in this documentary, it covered oh. the last big international tour in 1999. Yep. From the first song, from the second song, this woman is falling apart, okay, in these concerts. She's barely making it. And there's this one scene where she's singing I Will Always Love You. And right before that last big note, and, uh, you know that thing yes. she does? Her eyes were rolling around her head, and she was trying to contemplate it, and she was trying to wrap her head around how she was going to do that. Oh. It, right? It was. You feel the pain. It's palpable. Yeah. You feel the pain. I mean, yeah. it was. The documentary was so freaking amazing. I'm with yeah. you. It was so tragic. I guess what I was shocked to learn is I didn't think Sissy Houston, um, Whitney's mom, was so a part of the toxic. Really? Yeah. I mean, almost Sissy, I got the vibe, was almost jealous. Not almost. Uh, I think completely. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Jealous. Really, Sissy. She knew what she knew because I taught her that. That's what I taught her. Yeah. It really was sad. It was like yeah. Whitney had the career that Sissy wanted. Yeah. And Sissy could not find a good way to support her. And instead, you know, it sounds like they had issues with Robin, who I think Whitney really did have a physical relationship sure. with. Sure. I think they were very good friends, and I think they were uh, lovers. Yeah, and it was so sad when, like, Robin leaves the tour, and you're just like, oh, my God, it's the beginning of really the end. And they said that. And oh. they said that in the end. They were like, you know, when Robin left, Robin, everybody knows, you know, Whitney and Robin, um, Whitney never had another close friend around her on that level. So, I mean, if you haven't seen this thing, you have to watch it. But I even think that her cousin, Dion Warwick, I mean, I think that... But do you think Dion was jealous? I think they all were. Because, see, Whitney's yeah. fame superseded everyone. It became bigger than all of them. Definitely her church singing mama. Yes. You know? and, and Dion Warwick, who was the big star at the time. But then, you know, she was... Kind of, um, actually, I brought Dion, I brought Whitney up when I interviewed Dion earlier this How'd year. How'd that go? Do you remember? Did I tell you this? Mm, I feel like I did see something about this, but. She said, <laughs> why would I talk about Whitney? <gasps> She's dead. <gasps> why would I talk about Bobby Christina? She's dead. What? Next question. <gasps> so. So much jealousy so, there. So then I say, well, just because someone has passed on doesn't mean we never speak of them again we're all gonna die does that mean that you don't want anybody talking speaking of you when you die next question okay oh my god but really think about that we're all leaving here so i want people to talk about me and I think about me love the documentary because i did not think i really thought that her that whitney's family you know, I think this whole time you really think it's Bobby Brown. Mm -hmm. And I feel like over the years, you know, the past couple of years, people have really been like, it no. It was him, too. I mean, it was him. Yeah, Maybe it was, didn't start with him. Right. Because in the documentary, it comes out that Whitney and her brothers had been 
using drugs using since, they, drugs were since they were yeah teenagers. And her brother actually admitted to that when Oprah did the first interview with um, Sissy and I think Gary is his name. Yeah, he said I got Whitney on drugs. It was just so sad to see the family use her. You yeah. know, for yeah, she was a it. cash cow, no doubt about it. She <sighs> was the ATM machine. Isn't it heartbreaking? Yeah. But so much time. Ta- I mean, arguably one of the most. Probably the most talented best singers mm-hmm. of all time, mm-hmm. and just like but nobody. As that, as that goes away, Sarah, sorry to cut you off. Babe. No, as that goes away, because we all wow. saw it going away with Whitney and that oh, voice yeah. and the cracking and the screeching, and it got lower. And you heard from the guys in the band saying, "We dropped the register down, and then we drop it down again, and then we would drop it two more times." Till finally, I mean, she was sounding nothing like her former self. If we all knew it as fans. Then and in her uh, musical director, he knew it. Then the people around her had to know that oh, the yeah. voice was no longer. And it's just like, let's just save this person oh. that we have here. I know it was it was super tragic. So yeah. look, we love documentaries. If you're Ooh. watching one that you need to share with us, uh, definitely hit us up on social media. You can follow at Hey Frage on Instagram at Paul Wharton Style on Insta. Um, Paul, we are blessed enough and we love working with Mervis Diamonds. Yes. So we, um, you know, we've been talking about them. We've partnered with them. We got a cool event that we're going to announce really soon coming up. But if you're in the um, market to engagement ring shop, will you take Paul and me with you? We want to go. Oh, my God. Will you, will you, will you marry me, boy? Will you, will you, oh will you sing. marry me? Oh, my God. Paul and Abdul. That? Oh, my <laughs> God. To die for. Right. I it's mean, not happening for Sarah and I, but we definitely want to go with you. Right? <laughs> yeah, we do. So, will you email us, uh, Sarah at HeyFrage.com, Paul Warren Style at Yahoo.com. Let's go. We want to go with you. We want to take you into Mervis, um, help you diamond ring shop. It can be very intimidating, but we're going to take all that away with our awesome um, Mervis Diamonds. You can also go to MervisDiamonds.com. They have a couple locations in the D.C. area. Um, so go. And if you're not in the market like we are to get married, you can also buy yourself a great career gift. Absolutely. I, I love, um, I used to have a big girl. I still have the big girl bag. But I love giving yourself a big girl treat or a big mm-hmm. boy. Well, that kind yeah. of sounds really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> the big girl treat, I think, is, is much better. <laughs> but there's so many women going and buying themselves like a great pair of diamond earrings yeah. or, you know, a great bracelet. And Mervis has all that covered for you. I love it. Let's so, do it. Let's go shopping and we might even take you to lunch afterwards. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please email us because we really want to uh, to make that happen. Um, there were a couple other stories I wanted to get to and then we have to get to some uh, listener advice. Uh, also, I wanted to remind you, yesterday started my In the Mind of Frage podcast with Danny Starr who's a DC radio personality. Did you know her, by the way, Paul? Do you know much about her? I didn't. Well, we used to be uh, bitter radio oh rivals God. and not very good friends. We hated each other. How bitter? How low did you go? Um, well, we used to like tweet awful things to each other. Like I think when, so I was on 107.3, we had Sarah Ty and Mel and Danny was on Hot 99.5 on the Kane Show. <laughs> so uh, they, you know, they were beating us and, you know, we were trying to be up and coming or whatever. And I think, I can't remember what how the exact wording was. But I think Danny tweeted something at me about, like, know your place and, like, learn how to lose gracefully. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I think we were. Jeez. I was, like, writing something back about how awful yeah. she was. But yeah. anyhow, about a year and a half ago, we connected over social media. Okay. And then we met in person when we co-hosted this event together. And we just realized that we had a lot of similarities. And I think it's tough. You know, men see this, too. But I think for women in media, it's so easy to get pitted against each other. So I I wanted to have her on to really talk about, hey, how do you overcome that? And she's an author. She's a mom. And, and you know, she does a good job because she gets a lot of, of hate on. Really? Yeah, a lot of people don't like her. She's very outspoken about things like postpartum, her kids. A lot of people feel like she um, is all about her. But I think, I mean, I think she has a great message and she's doing it and she's got a good career. So how was the show? How was the interview? It was really good. It's two parts. So part one came out yesterday. And it was great. We talked a little bit about our radio stuff, but I really wanted it to focus on, hey, look, how did two women come together, support each other, yeah. you know, not be jealous, not tear each other down. And then, you know, how does she deal with, because she gets a lot of backlash. So how do you keep going? You know, when people mm. criticize her parenting skills, it's really, it's a lot. That's, well, I'm going to listen, first of all. Okay. Uh, the last time I was, 
Hi. The last time I was in the room and two women were trying to come together was um, when Omarosa did the Bethany Frankel <gasps> talk show. Do you remember that? Oh, my God. I think I vaguely do remember, do remember this. Why fight? did those two not? Why did those two not like each other? Well, OK, so I'm Googling this, by the way. So, yeah. So Bethany Omarosa was on um, the Martha Stewart Apprentice. And Bethany, you know, asked oh. Omarosa for advice. And I think there was just, you know, some woman on woman hate. And who knows how that all starts? Okay. So they had this big beefing situation. Okay. And then Omarosa actually oh went to the show. Okay, okay here's, yeah. here's Omarosa on Bethany. I was there with her. With things. We have to be... We have to be exceptional to get anything in this business. I wasn't calling her mediocre. I wasn't calling her mediocre because clearly, okay. clearly it's she's okay. doing well. I'm here on your show, and I think that's fantastic. And you're $10,000 richer. And $10,000 richer. Um, but I think it's important to understand that you don't stay a decade on television in reality TV without being smart and creating a brand that oh people God, want. Oh, my God, I love it. So let me Did tell you about the $10,000. I'm sorry. I was, like, completely into that clip. Now I'm So like the $10,000, okay, so if you saw before that, you know, earlier in the show, Bethany oh. says uh, to Omarosa, what's your brand? You know, what, what is your brand? And she's trying to get Omarosa to say exactly what her brand is. And then Omarosa says, my brand is smart. And Bethany's like, smart? Smart, that's a brand. And Omarosa's like, yeah, there is a brand in that. And then Omarosa says that Bethany said something, you know, pretty specific about her. I can't remember what it was. And then Bethany said, I never said that. And she said, oh, yes, she did. You said that I am a blah, 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 blah. So then uh, Bethany says, if you're right, I'll give you $10,000. So then Omarosa says, Paul, Paul, I'm standing backstage. Oh, um, oh great. Paul has his phone. Uh, he can come out here and say, look, I was backstage like, oh, no, you won't. <laughs> oh, 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 no. Okay. People were going crazy backstage. All the lawyers were coming down. They had security come. I mean, it was they were going off on each other. By the way, what was the vibe you got from Bethany? She like is she? Is... She was too cool for school that particular day. I yeah, mean, of okay. course, she was on the edge because she and Omarosa had this thing going on. Got it. Got it. And at one point, and I'm telling this story wow. because at one point, Omarosa said, "We have the opportunity as two women to turn this thing around." Oh. And Bethany says, "No, we don't." And then the whole audience went crazy. But they had like an audience um, applause person like hyping the applause up. Sure. So they were really perpetuating that negativity. So I really, you know, respect what you and Danny have done and how y'all were able to come back together and talk about these things because it's not easy, but you do have the opportunity to turn it around. Yeah, and I I, I tell a little tidbit on the um, podcast, but she Danny is now on TLC Me Now, which is like a little um, it's a, it's a show. It's not a little show. It's like her own kind of show and segment on TLC. And I auditioned for that same thing, and I told her I said you actually got that role. And they I remember them emailing me and saying, Hey, yeah, we went with this other DC radio personality, and this was kind of. I think this I've was like heard of this show. Before. Me now? Yeah, TLC me. Okay. It might be just TLC me. Okay. And it's like a three minute uh, segment. Danny talks pop culture and things and mom stuff or and whatever. It comes and throughout. Uh, yeah. It's like a, an interstitial. Yes. Okay, yes, great. yes, yes. And so I just, I remember we, we kind of on this uh, podcast, we talk all about that okay. and, and now rooting for each other. Um, but I, I, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot, but is Omarosa still going to have a job? Um, Am I putting you on the spot? No, because okay. I don't know these things. Well, she just, I just, when I was Googling Omarosa and Bethany, yeah. the latest thing that comes up is that um, Omarosa tells TMZ that she is not worried at all about being fired. After John Kelly, there were rumors that he's pushing out Omarosa for, quote, triggering Trump. I really want to have Omarosa back on the show. Well, what think? What I you? think that, uh, well, what I read is that he is kind of limiting access during the business day to the Oval Office. To her and a lot of other people, oh. right? So Trump can still, you know, dial them digits at night. You know what I mean? Got and it, do all that, and they can still communicate in that way. But I mean, I think that there do need to be kind of limitations on who just saunters into the Oval Office. Do you think Omarosa is warming up to the idea of coming back on and doing another live show with us? You know what? I have not spoken with her about it. <laughs> we have her own issues at this point with, you yes, know, I'm the world collapsing <laughs> around us. I'm a little bit salty about that. So uh, um, I'm not really the right person to ask. <laughs> all right. Well, she still has a job so far. Hey, what about this? Oh, my God. 
God, Paul, I want to interview this woman. And uh, have you ever, like, known anyone or has anyone ever approached you to be a part of a Ponzi scheme? Like, has anyone ever wanted to invest your money and you thought, oh, my God, this person is full of shit? Mm. Dawn J. Bennett. Do you know, I want to know if you know this clothing store. She lived in Chevy Chase, Maryland. She Her apartment was just raided by the FBI uh, early August. And in the paper, the interesting part of this, she was running a Ponzi fraud. But also agents said that they discovered a lot of voodoo stuff, including a beef tongue shut up hoodoo spell a procedure calling for slitting open an animal tongue um she also had another note that was scratched with an incantation i cross you and cover you come under my command i command you to hold your tongue and then she started um saying these spells and trying to perform these spells as the sec and the fbi were like raiding her apartment and arresting her oh my god this (laughs) sounds horrible Oh, my God. But the craziest part is this, Paul. She had a syndicated financial show in 20 markets across the U.S. where Bennett would give older people advice, and then they became her targets. It, beca- it was the radio show was Financial Myth Busting with Dawn Bennett. It was syndicated in 20 markets, targeted elderly and financially unsophisticated investors by materially misrepresenting the company's profitability. Wow. I know. But she had a clothing store up in... Um, up in Chevy Chase, and I wanted to see called an, what and men's clothing. I think it's men's called, clothing. Uh, DJ Bennett. Did you ever go to DJ Bennett? No. DJ Bennett. Here it is. The world of sporting luxury. Oh my god! And it was in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Wow. She says, "Yeah, um, they're having a clearance sale." I oh, bet. I guess they are. <laughs> <laughs> Contact us. I guess they are. No, I don't know this person. I've never heard of her, and I, I don't think I have. Oh, my God. I just wondered if she was all, ever on the fashion scene. You know what's so funny? Like, I'd be one of those people that... She has, like, 1,100 followers. I'd on be one that. of these people that they, you know, that say, oh, I've never heard of that person, and then they'd find, like, 10 pictures of me with... <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you know how many people we meet. Yeah. Oh, my God. Tons. You never know. And I watch these kind of, you know, depositions, you know, and people saying, oh, I've never met that person. Oh, well, we saw you in Russia with them. You know, yeah, and I'm like, like uh... I'm on the other side of the TV like, mm-hmm. He knew he knew. <laughs> <laughs> but if that were me, no, I definitely wouldn't know. Oh, my God. Well, this story really is just, it has every element. I'm like, oh, my God, we got to get her on the podcast. I mean, for all the work she put into that, couldn't she have just had a real business? I don't know, but she they think that she scammed $20 million from people. Uh, Bennett's career, the now 55-year-old, presented herself as a skilled and successful, successful advisor, which she had none of that. And she had an incredible <laughs> shoe collection. Um so they said that she had Bennett was only managing forty two million in assets. Forty two million though. Wow. That's an incredible amount of money. Um, she had luxury sporting good business, which she opened in twenty ten, and that also was a huge additional drain on her personal wealth. The SEC also says that she had tons of jars with mysterious liquid in them that she apparently was also using to cast spells. Ooh. Oh, girl. Anyway, I don't know if anyone knows her, but she is local to DC and I Couldn't I'm like, she have just married well? I mean <laughs> She's a nice looking, she appears she to be is. a nice looking woman. Dawn Bennett financial myth busting. That's kind of a picture of I her. I see her. Yeah, she's a good looking woman, I mean, right? Gosh, you needed all that. Just get you a man with some money. Dawn Bennett. Anyway, all gone. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, God, Kesara. do we Kesara, Do we know her or Shit. not? No, I don't know. <laughs> no, we don't. Uh, do you eat chips? You probably don't eat chips, right? You know, I eat veggie chips. Oh, you do? I do. Uh, there's a new list out of the best, 10 best chip brands uh, voted on by Americans. Got any idea what uh, number one would be? I'll give um, you just the top five. Number one. Was Utz still in there? The kettle? The kettle? Uh, I don't think Utz made the list. Okay. <laughs> See, <laughs> it's that's... been a while since I had a chip. <laughs> <laughs> um, the I, top? Still, I, I still have a weakness for chips, I, I have to say. I don't remember what the names of the chip brands are. Oh, okay. You don't even eat any chips. Well, that's fine. Um, Ruffles, <laughs> Ruffles Cheddar that, Sour you Cream. Me? <laughs> no, not at all. Good for you. I'm like, I love that you have the self-will not to eat them. I eat them like all the time. Um, Ruffles Cheddar Sour Cream was number three on the list. Uh, number two on the list was Cool Ranch Doritos. Number one, this is the favorite chip oh. of Americans is Cheetos. Cheetos. You believe that? I know I Cheetos, Cheetos. I know Doritos. I know Ruffles. Uh, yeah, well, that one story was lame because you don't eat any. Uh, I don't, but I might start. My mouth is watering right chips. now. Oh, my God. Uh, we had two listener emails that want advice. 
Um, I'll read you the first one and see what you think. Yeah. Uh, hey, Sarah. I'd love some dating advice from you and Paul. I met this guy. Let's call him Joe. He is recently separated in the beginning of the year, and he has two kids. We started hanging out in May. We would see each other three to four times a week consistently. We'd go out for drinks to each other's house. I even took him out to a really nice restaurant and... um, you know, and had one of his favorite artists paint something for his birthday. Everything we did screamed dating. When we would go out, he did all the right things. He'd hold my hand, have his arm around me, give me those random kisses. Even at his house, he'd always pull me closer to him or do anything you'd think a boyfriend would do. We talked all day, every day. Fast forward. Last week, he said he was out with his boys. Totally fine. I didn't text him or communicate with him because I respected boys' night out. But something in my gut just didn't feel right. The next morning rolls around, and he's really quiet. I knew something was up. Turned out he was on a date. He told me that our relationship was to boyfriend-girlfriend and that he wants to date and meet other people. This is after we hung out that night before, and everything was as normal. If as if nothing was out of place, he was super affectionate. What is with guys always wanting to explore their options? Why can't they just be satisfied with what's in front of them? Isn't dating per- a progression? Which uh, wouldn't that, which wouldn't that mean he'll just end up in the same exact spot? Mm. Why do I feel so bad about this? Help me understand the complicated brain of men. What do you think? Hmm. Well, it's not just men that do that. It's women too. It's women too. You know, we have a mutual friend. <laughs> I love this friend, and I don't know why he's single, but he is always single, and he's always like that guy where he goes out on a date with a woman, and she's there with somebody else. Well, I can't figure it out. He was out on a date with my friend. It was their third date, and I was there in the same place. It was during a cocktail party, and literally, I saw her like meet someone else and start making out with this guy during the date. What do you think it is with him? By the way, we haven't used his name. You got any thoughts on what it is with him? Hmm. Because he's a nice-looking uh, good guy. guy. I know, he's handsome. You know him better than I mean, would you, would you be with him if you weren't with uh, your man? Yeah, I think I would try. I would probably go out on some dates. Because I feel like I get the best version. You know what mm-hmm, I mean? Like, mm-hmm. we're, we're friends. Like, we help each other out when we're hosting charity events. We have drinks. But I don't really, like, know him, like... Maybe he's too nice. Because too nice? girls like a guy that gives them some trouble... They're always apologizing. Oh, sorry. That's just yeah, John. I think there is. He's really crude. He's just an asshole. But then they go home with him. Well, I think the problem with our friend that we're talking about mm-hmm. is that guy, I think, is too nice too soon and okay. too sensitive too soon. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think women like that, but they like the reveal. Yeah. And I think he's like all out too much, too quickly. Sure. Like well, he's the one talking about he wants the, the, the kids. I and think the, so. And the I, Range Rover. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, here's my advice for this woman that wrote in. I don't know that she's going to like this. I know they've been hanging out with May since May, but I think unless you have had a real serious talk, which she does say that, you know, at one point he referred to her as that they were girlfriend, boyfriend, but... I think the I think guy she said just, he was acting girlfriend boyfriend, but he did tell her what his intention was. Yeah, I which mean, was just to, just to date. Well, it sounded like he just wanted to date. I mean, yeah. I don't think you can hold it against this guy. I would give this guy space. He is just newly separated, yeah. by the way. So, I mean, the guy may want to go out, and that's why I feel like if you're dating a newly divorced guy, pump the brakes. Yeah. Don't you think like they Absolutely. need to meet other people? Absolutely. Do you have any other advice for? I would say this. I would give him space. I would not. I wouldn't hold this against him. Would you? No, I, think he was I mean, with I you. think I think that women and and people need to start taking people for what they say and not, you know. Well, he said this, but his actions said that. You know, his eyes said right. that he wanted to be with me. His heart, ooh, his hand, he was all over me. You know what I mean? The yeah. man said he just wants to date. You know, and anybody just getting out of a relationship, especially when there's kids involved. I mean, that would be really, really tough to go and jump right into another relationship. So we have to kind of stand down our desperation because in a way, we all have a little, you know, we have a tendency to be a little bit desperate. Yeah. Do you know? No, I'm with you. If I were her, I would give him space. I'd Mm -hmm. be like, cool. I know it's heartbreaking inside, but I think the guy is just coming off a divorce. Mm -hmm. Let him go meet other people. Sure. And I always think people get very invested, like... 
now, once I read before I met Dan, I really come to the conclusion that I'm not going to take it personally. Because if you really think about it, in this lifetime, we really walk with like maybe two or three people that are truly like meaningful for us, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to me that you have to kiss a million frogs. Like you're going to go through tons of guys who are women that aren't into you, Mm -hmm. that aren't your match. So once I met Dan, I was really at a good place, which I think is when things happen for people, where I was like, you know what? I'm no longer offended. If they don't text, they don't call, if it gets awkward, it's just that, you know, that's probably not my person and it's okay. Yeah. And it is, and it is okay. I remember meeting a guy who told me that he had been in jail for 17 days for being a graffiti writer. And I just remember in my head thinking, God, he's so cute. So that's not that bad, you know? (laughs) And then he said (laughs) that he got it. Like he drinks sometimes and gets into fights with people on the street. And then he said that the cops tackled him and they took him to jail and his mom had to pay $2,500 to get him out. And I thought, well, I mean, the cops got to him before and he's got a nice mom that loves them. Do you know what I mean? Like this was a while back and I'm just like, wow. And then I remember catching myself and being like, I mean, how desperate can you be? (laughs) I mean, you know what I mean? What do you want this man to break out all the windows in your car? (laughs) Because that's happened on the next podcast. I'll tell that story. Coming up. Um, one last email, too. Um, Emma writes to us, and she goes, Hey, you guys, I love you and Paul. You are the best. I know you've said in one of the episodes that you get thousands of emails, but I hope you'll see this one. We did. Only this one, I think, came like a couple months ago. So sorry. We're a little late. I could really use your advice because I feel you always have great answers and that the thing you say is so relatable. I have lots of problems with overthinking things. I literally overthink everything. And it's starting to get to me. I'm at a point where I can't live like this anymore do you have any advice on what to do to be more carefree and just do stuff without debating it in your head a million times maybe it could be a topic on the podcast keep up the great work Mm. any thoughts on how to be more carefree stop stop overthinking things just stop You, you, you just have to stop you really do um i mean you know you can talk about meditation and in these other kind of ways to kind of center yourself, which are really important. But I mean, I feel like maybe not to the level of this, of this young woman, but I used to do the same thing and I just had to stop because my brain was going a million miles per hour and you know, my heart's racing and I'm talking to myself, walking around. It just became too much. I just, one day I just said, I I can't do this anymore. I just stopped. I didn't take any medication. I didn't go to therapy, which I probably should have. I just stopped. I love therapy. I was going to say, I mean, I have a couple pieces of advice. One, therapy is great. Mindfulness therapy is great because Mm -hmm. um, mindfulness, all it, it just creates awareness about you and your personality. But two, I would say don't surround yourself with people that overthink or are neuro- neurotic because that's not going to help. And three, I think, I don't know how you feel, Paul, but I think when you begin to approach life as like, look, I'm going to fuck things up. Sure. Like, it's not all going to be good. Yeah. I'm going to make mistakes. Then I think you begin to relax, forgive yourself. And I have to give myself lots of pep talks. Like, you know what? Today, hey, you did five things. You accomplished something. Like, Instead of always striving or thinking, like, i got to be doing something else. So know that you're going to fuck it up. Who cares? But give that pep talk to yourself, too. Yeah. So I'll do the first reading from Pulling It All Together, <gasps> Essential Style is this, your, is this your book? Okay. Yes. And I talk about, I talk about this in the book. So, <laughs> look, I, oh I actually God. say the answer is actually simple. You stop it. And then I say, learn to sense when you are spiraling, when this chain of doubt is forming. Recognize that you are starting to do it. Focus your mind and say, no. Now, this is what I actually did, okay? No. Step into a separate room or bathroom. Take a few deep and slow breaths and just force your mind to stop adding to that chain. Focus on how to fix the situation. And if it can't be fixed, then just try to let it go. It really won't be the end of the world. It won't even be the end of your life. Oh, my God. I love this. You're like the new Deepak Chopra. Fuck Deepak. We just need Paul. That was amazing. Oh, my God. Yes. The first reading was wow. on the Hey Friends of Paul Ward and Paul Gilles. That was amazing. All right. Hey, you just got to stop. I think that's it, Paul. I think we should just stop right here with our Oh, podcast. I love it. I love this song. Doesn't it just make me want to spin around and just think of that day you put that big Mervis diamond on your finger? <laughs> <laughs> Three carrots, please. <laughs> At least. 
Oh, Paul, that I was such a good you. show. I, I love, love you. I love you. Oh, and I love this this um, listener feedback. Baby, who will you, will you, will you marry me, boy? Will you, will you marry me? Oh. <laughs> I love you, Sarah. I love you, too, Paul Ward. Thanks, guys. You guys, download and share the podcast, please. Yes, and email us, Sarah at HeyPhrase.com and Paul Wharton Style at Yahoo.com and follow us on social media. We love you so much. Bye, guys. Bye.